Hello, friends, and welcome back. So glad that you joined us today for our episode. As we continue our study of the book of Romans, we are already in chapter number four. Hard to believe we're moving that quickly, but uh, it it is what it is. And we're moving, I think, at a pace where we can understand it and yet not get bogged down by it. And I just love chapter four because chapter four in the book of Romans is just so logical. It's not to say that human logic and the Bible always go together because sometimes God asks us to do some things and sometimes God even does some things that defy logic. And so logic is not the end all be all, but the arguments that the Apostle Paul makes for salvation by grace through faith and for the fact that people have never been saved by works They've always been saved as a result of God's grace and their faith in what God has done or will do. And we find that so masterfully illustrated in Romans chapter 4. Remember, we've talked about this a bit because back in chapter 3, the Bible says that the gospel of the righteousness of God revealed uh, was witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember that? The law that refers to the first five books of the Bible, what the Jews call the Torah, and then the prophets. That would essentially be of the rest of the Bible. Sometimes the Old Testament is referred to as the law and the prophets and the writings or the Tanakh. But uh, f- for sake of argument, the, the Apostle Paul is talking about the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And a great example of a character in the law would be Abraham. After all, he's the father of the Jewish people, the the nation of Israel, Abraham, father Abraham. So if Abraham's story could in some way buttress this idea that we're saved by grace through faith, and if a character that could be detailed from the prophets, and of course, a great example of somebody in the prophets, not in the first five books of the Bible, but whose story is told in the prophets would be David. And you'd be hard-pressed to find two better examples in the Bible or two more weighty examples in the Bible than Abraham and David. But that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does. He uses the example of Abraham. Really, that's the main example in chapter 4, but also the example of David and his testimony in chapter 4 to undergird all the arguments that he made in chapter 3, and that is that we are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and our righteousness is that which is imputed to us by faith. Now, how does the Old Testament prove that? Uh, That's the lesson for today. So look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 1, where uh, the apostle says, what shall we say then? What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Okay, so uh, let's talk about Abraham. Let's talk about what was his experience. What did he find to be true in his dealings and interactions with God? I mean, after all, if we're saved by works, if righteousness comes by the law, then shouldn't the forefather, the founder of the Jewish nation, wouldn't his testimony be the the best example of that? Well, watch what it says in verse number two. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So remember last episode, we talked about the fact that if justification is by faith and not by works, then we have nothing to brag about. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So we talked about this. So if if I am saved through no work of my own, through no effort of my own, but simply by faith trusting in all of what Jesus did, all of the work that is his, then I have no grounds at all for boasting. That's why the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian believers, it's uh, not by works, lest any man should boast. Our boasting is in Christ and in Christ alone. So here the question is asked, so what about Abraham? 
If Abraham were justified by works, then he could brag about it, but but not before God. Uh, he couldn't do so with a straight face before God because the fact is he was not justified by works. Abraham was justified by faith, just as we are justified by faith. Now, Abraham was justified by believing what God would do, and we are justified by believing what God did do in Christ. But the fact is, we're justified by faith. Look at verse number three of our text, Romans chapter four and verse three. For what saith the scripture? And I love how the Apostle Paul always comes back to the authority of Scripture, not just New Testament Scripture, because the New Testament didn't even exist as Paul was writing the Romans. Little did he know that the book of Romans would one day be part of the New Testament. He was writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he penned this epistle. So when Paul referred to Scripture, he was always referring to Old Testament Scripture. And when Paul was making an an emphatic case about this topic, justification by faith, he appealed to the authority of Scripture. And he said in verse number three, what saith the Scripture? And here it is. It's a quotation from Genesis chapter number 12. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God. This is what the Scripture says. Abraham believed God and it was counted, reckoned, imputed credited to his account. It was counted unto him for righteousness. So how was Abraham deemed to be righteous? By faith, because he believed the promise that God made. And what was that promise? That promise was that Abraham's seed, through Abraham's seed, the world would be blessed. Now, remember, when God told Abraham that, He had no seed. He had no children. He had no offspring. He was already old. And we're going to find out he gets that promise reiterated when he's even older. And so he had to believe some things in spite of what the circumstances of his life were telling him. Because the circumstances of his life argued against that promise. And yet Abraham saw the credibility of God as being greater than the incredibility of the circumstances that surrounded him. What a, what a, what a man of faith he was. And when God told Abraham, I'm going to bless the world through your seed. And the, the reference there was ultimately to the Messiah, the seed through whom God would save the world, the seed by whom God would rescue the world, redeem the world. Uh, the seed. That's why Galatians chapter three, Paul makes the emphatic case that he saith not and deceives as of many, but to thy seed, which is Christ. So understand that the promise that was made to Abraham by God was a gospel promise. It's the same reason why Galatians chapter three says the gospel was preached before Unto Abraham. In what sense was the gospel preached? In this sense, that this promise of the seed was a promise of the coming Savior. And Abraham believed what God said he would do. And therefore, that belief, that trust in God was reckoned, imputed, counted to Abraham for righteousness, not works. It wasn't what Abraham did, it's what God was going to do. And Abraham believed the promise of of God. Love it. Look at verse number four. Here's the, con- here's not the conclusion, but here's the, here's the uh, principle based upon this real life story of Abraham. Verse number four. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned by grace, but of debt. Okay. So as a general principle, if I work for something and I get the reward of that work, That reward is given to me not because of my belief, but because of my work. For instance, if I go out and work for $20 an hour to dig ditches, after eight hours, I expect to get $160 for the work that I did. So the reward, that $160, is not a matter of faith. It's not a matter of grace. It's a matter of work because uh, I've worked for it. That's what it's saying. 
there, there, there's a debt. That person who hired me owes me that money for the work that I've done, right? The wages that I deserve because of what I've done. So the Bible says here, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned by grace. No, it's reckoned, but of debt. There's a, I am owed that because I have worked for that. Look at verse number five, but, so here's the contrast, but to him that worketh not. And that's our whole argument that we don't work for our salvation. We don't work to achieve the righteousness of God that is given to us and revealed through the gospel. No, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. Do you see the mutual exclusivity of those terms? Work and belief, work and belief. Sometimes our hyper-Calvinist friends try to teach, well, you know, even investing faith is in itself a work. No, the Bible is very explicit throughout the book of Romans and Galatians and elsewhere that a work and the and the investment of faith are mutually exclusive. They are, they exclude each other. You can't have be saved by faith and at and also work or be saved by works and also faith. No, they're mutually exclusive. It's one or the other. So the Bible says here, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So that's the illustration of Abraham that our faith is counted for. Uh, that's the way by which the imputation of the righteous record of Christ is credited to my account by faith. Wow. So that's the law in the sense that the law, the first five books of the Bible. So the law, Abraham is a huge character featured in the first five books of the Bible in Genesis. And his story undergirds it, it, validates the fact that we're justified by faith because Abraham was justified by faith. But remember back in chapter three, Paul made the case that it's witnessed by the law. We saw that in Abraham and the prophets. So is there a good example of somebody whose story is told in the rest of the Bible, not the first five books of the Bible, but the rest of the Bible who would also attest to the fact that we are saved by grace through faith? And of course, the answer is yes. And it's not that Abraham is the only illustration. And it's not that David, uh, an example from the prophets, is the only illustration. It's that just that they are great illustrations whom Paul is using. So look at verse number six. Matter of fact, I, I just glanced up at the clock. So let's do this. Let's stop at verse number five. And we've talked about the marvelous example of Abraham. We'll come back to him. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the example of David. We'll start with him next episode. And so until then, just have a great day in the Lord. Appreciate your patience uh, listening to these podcasts. Hope to see you again. God bless you, my friends.